Okay. So this is the, the module objective that we have. So section one deals with evidence handling and attack uh, attribution. Okay. So digital forensics, of course, just deals with recovering and investigating of information which is found on digital devices as it relates to criminal activity. Okay, so indicators of compromise are the evidence that a cyber security incident, you know, has occurred. All right, uh, in the US, they have the HIPAA regulations. Okay, that is, if there is a data breach related to the patients, okay, that hospital or whatever organization, it has to notify the individuals about the data breach, okay? Digital forensics investigation must be used to determine who has been affected and also to certify the number of individuals that have been affected, okay? So at these times, Cyber security analysts must find themselves in direct contact with digital forensic evidence. Okay, so you'll be working with digital evidence. All right, so digital forensics, of course, deals with when there's a cyber security incident, you have to go on the scene, you get the evidence, you preserve the evidence, you analyze the evidence, and then, of course, you are supposed to present that evidence in court. Okay, so we have different types of models that we can use in digital forensics. One of them is a model which was done by NIST. And this model has four uh, stages or phases. The first one is correction. So this has got to do with identifying of potential sources of forensic data and acquisition, handling and storage of that data, okay? Examination, assessing and extracting relevant information from the collected data, okay? And then analysis here, you have to draw, you know, some conclusions from the data and correlation of data from multiple sources. And then the last phase is reporting. So this deals with preparing and presenting information that has you know, resulted from the analysis that was done, okay? So we are correcting you know, the evidence from the media, okay? When we are examining what we're dealing with, with what we're dealing with now here is data and data is anything which doesn't make sense. But when we will be analyzing, what I'm going to have is information. You know, information is something which makes sense. So information comes from data. And then when we will be reporting, what we'll be reporting will be the evidence, okay? So we have different types of evidence. There is direct evidence, so the evidence that was indisputably in the possession of the accused, or maybe there is the eyewitness there. We call that direct evidence. And then indirect evidence, the evidence, uh, you know, this evidence has to be established from hypothesis in combination with other facts. And this also is called substantial uh, evidence, okay? So uh, there is, you know, somebody committed a particular, the same offense, you know. So, you know, he can be the suspect. Maybe the tools which were used, you know, best evidence, this evidence could be storage devices used by the accused or archive, archives or files that can be proven to be unaltered, okay? 
corroborating evidence, this evidence supports an assertion that that is developed from best uh, evidence. Okay, so how do we correct the evidence? Okay, so we have, you know, two types of uh, memory. And of course, we are supposed to start from memory. So the, the two types of memory, uh, the memory that we have uh, is, you know, volatile memory. So this is a type of memory whereby when we switch off the, the laptop, whatever we have in that memory goes. And then we have non-volatile memory. This is a type of memory whereby even though we switch off the laptop, the, the, you know, it, it's still going to have uh, the content it has. Okay, so we have to start with the most volatile memory, which is the RAM. So we get evidence from there and then move on to the fixed disks. And then finally, we go to archive data. Okay, so that is the order in which we should correct uh, memory. Okay, the chain of custody. So here, this is a very, very important component in digital forensics. So it deals with, you know, uh, the thing here is that uh, you really need to convince the, the judge that while you were analyzing the, the evidence, no one tempered with the evidence. So when you are on the cyber scene, you're supposed to have the equipment, you know, you do the recording of whatever you are doing you know, video recording, you take photos and so on, you know, because you have to prove in court that no one tempered with the data. So that is the chain of custody, okay? So it involves the correction, handling and securing and secure storage of evidence. So what normally happens is that uh, if we are suspecting that, uh, you know, the evidence is on the hard drive. So what normally happens what happen is that uh, there are some tools which are used to make copies of the hard drive. So before you start working on that hard drive, you're supposed to generate a hash. Remember the hash value. So you generate the hash on that uh, uh, hard drive, actual hard drive, and then on the copy, you also generate the hash. Okay, so when you start working on that copy, after you, are, you, are, you have done the, the analysis, you are supposed to generate the, another hash. So those hashes should match, you know. The same hashes, you know, if you have the same hashes, it means that you never tempered with that hard drive, you know. That's how you can convince the, the judge in court that, you know, no one tempered with, with evidence. Okay, so detailed record should be kept of the following. Who discovered and collected the evidence? Okay, all details regarding the details of evidence, including the times, places, and personnel involved. Okay, mm -hmm. who has primary responsibility for the evidence? When responsibility was assigned? Okay, when custody was changed? Okay. Who has physical access to the evidence while it was stored? Access should be restricted to only the most essential personnel, okay? Data integrity and preservation. So I talked about hashing here, okay? So time stamping of files should be preserved. Hence, the original evidence should be coped and analysis should be conducted on the copies of the original. Okay, so digital forensics, it is a course on its own. It's a big thing. It has the, a number of tools that you must know. This is also a very, very important course that you, you, you have to do, I mean, that you have to do. Okay, it has to be done. The timestamp may be part of evidence. Opening of files from the original media should be avoided. 
archive and protect the original disk to keep it in its original and tempered with condition. Special tools should be used to preserve forensic evidence before the device is shut down and evidence is lost. So when you go on the scene, don't have just to go and switch, on, switch off the computers. It doesn't work like that. Otherwise, you're going to lose evidence. Okay, so you see here, users should not disconnect, unplug, or turn off infected machines unless explicitly told to do so by what? Security personnel. Okay. Following this process will ensure that any evidence of malpractice will be preserved and any, and any indicators of compromise can be identified. Okay. And then afterwards we have attack attribution. So here with attack attribution, we are supposed to determine, you know, who carried out an, uh, you know, an attack. So very, very important that we need to trace the attacker through uh, what is known as attack distribution. I mean, attack attribution, sorry. Now, how do you know which organization, which individual or which country hacked our institution? It is by looking at the tactics, the techniques and the procedures which were used in the attack. Okay? So that's how it works. Because the, the tools which are used in China, the coding of, that, of those tools is, is similar. You know, in the States, in Russia, the techniques, I mean, the tactics and the procedures, they are similar. It is from that where you can be able to tell that this attack was done by the Russians and so on and so forth. But, you know, uh, <laughs> it is not like that anyway. In real life, you know, because, you know, uh, I'm told that, you know, these countries, they have learned these techniques. So, they can, you know, it can be another country which is going to use the hacking techniques and, you know, tactics and procedures of, of, of maybe the Chinese. But, you know, it, it is another country doing that. But, you know, some people are going to say it's the Russians or it is the Chinese. Okay. So that's how uh, uh, it is here. So you can see um, some aspects of a threat that can aid in attribution are the location of originating hosts or domains, features of the code used in malware and the two and other techniques. For internal threats, asset management play, plays a major role and covering the, 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 the devices from, uh, from which an attack was launched can lead directly to the threat actor. So we have got IP addresses, MAC addresses, and DHCP logs can help track the addresses used in the attack back to a particular device. Okay, we can say this, but you know, hackers are, attackers are really clever people. They can be able to falsify all these you know, uh, types of IP addresses. Okay. So uh, apart from uh, you know what what we, we saw on uh, you know we looked at um, at uh, NIST uh, framework. We also have other frameworks done by you know we have the meter attack framework. Okay, so the meter. So we have got the, the meter techniques tactics and techniques and common knowledge framework. So this one enables us, you know, it gives us the ability to detect attackers, techniques, tactics, and procedures as part of the threat defense and attack attribution, okay? Tactics consist of the technical goals 
that an attacker must accomplish to execute an attack, okay? Then techniques, these are the means by which tactics are what? Are accomplished, okay? And then procedures, these are specific actions taken by the threat actor in the techniques that have been identified, okay? So the meta attack framework is a global knowledge of threat attack behavior, how the threat actors uh, do behave, okay? So the framework is designed to enable automated information sharing by defining data structures for exchanging information between its community of users and the meter uh, itself. Okay, so you, you see you, you need to do an internet search on this. So you, you know, when, this, when, when you see not, do more research, make sure you have to, to do that because you find that uh, uh, when when you be writing certification, you know they can get some 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 questions uh, from you know uh, where they, they they say that you know go and read more on this. You have to do that because some questions might come uh, from there. Okay. So here uh, we have the figure shows analysis of ransomware exploit from the any.run online sandbox. The columns show the enterprise attack metrics techniques with, with or tactics with the te techniques that are used by uh, malware. Okay, so here you have got the initial access. This is execution. This is uh, persistence. So in terms of, of execution, uh, the malware can be executed through an API or it can be executed through some, some user interaction. Uh, how can it remain on the system? It can remain on the system by using, you know, browser what? Extensions. You know, uh, you find that we normally add these extensions, but some of them, they're not good at all. And then defense evasion, how, how, how does it, uh, you know, hide? You know, it can install the root certificate. It can modify some registries, okay? How can it be discovered through the querying of the registry and so on, okay? So this, that's how, you know, ransomware behave. Okay, section two deals with what is known as the cyber kill chain. So, the cyber kill chain, which was developed by Lockheed Martin, you know, to identify and prevent cyber intrusion. So it has seven steps which threat actors follow. The first one is reconnaissance, gathering of information. Afterwards, weaponization. The threat actors, they have to come up with a weapon. And then delivery, how are they going to deliver that weapon to the victim, okay? And then exploitation. Okay. Okay, so uh, exploitation, of course, here now, the weapon has to be executed on the vulnerability which was discovered. And then, of course, installation. So you see, after exploitation, then the threat actors are supposed to install the back door on the system. Why? So that they can continue having access to the system, okay? And then we have command and control, okay? So this part is used to communicate with the infected hosts, okay? So the hackers, they use C and C to, to communicate with the infected hosts. And then action on objectives, of course, this is, you know, what the, the hackers have achieved, you know? 
have they stolen the information right have ha, has data been corrupted and so on so very very important that you must know these steps which threat actors use okay so you see during reconnaissance so reconnaissance is the same like a thief coming into your neighborhood you know to check whether you have got a dog you know whether you have got a war fence and so on that is reconnaissance and that is what hackers do okay so during this stage they can be harvesting email addresses they can be identifying employees of the organization on social media okay they can be collecting public you know uh, you know information related to your organization press releases awards conference at, uh, attendees and so on you know discovering internet facing servers in your organization this is very very important conducting scans of the network to identify what what ip addresses you are using and what are some of the ports which are open okay on your part as an, an uh, as an analyst you know you have to be uh, searching you know the web logs looking for alerts and 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 you know historical searching data okay data mine browse uh, analytics okay and also prioritizing defense around technologies and people that the cancer activities is, is targeting so from this you can be able to know uh, who is being targeted in your organization okay so you see after you know the the attackers they have gathered information about your organization now you know they know uh, the weaknesses that your organization has you know has then they have to come up with a weapon okay they have to come up with a weapon so it is often uh, more effective to use a zero day attack to avoid detection so a zero day attack is an attack which is launched by attackers when a vulnerability has been known so this vulnerability is known and the manufacturers of that particular software have not yet released a patch so that is called a zero day you start counting the the number of days before the the manufacturers of that particular software do release a patch okay so a zero day attack uses a weapon that is unknown to defenders and what network security systems okay so during this stage uh you know the threat actors you know they'll be you know obtaining automated tools which they can use to deliver the payload okay selecting and creating of documents which they can present to the victims okay. selecting or creating a backdoor <laughs> and you know c and c infrastructure on your part what are you supposed to be doing ensuring that you know the ids rules and signatures are up to date conducting full malware analysis in your organization okay building build de de detections for the behavior of known weaponizers okay collecting files and so on all right now now that they have this weapon how are they going to deliver it to the you know to the target what are the hackers going to use okay they can deliver the weapon you know directly against the the servers you know or they can do it indirectly through the use of malicious email or infected usb stick social media interaction or through compromised websites okay on your part as an as an analyst uh, as an analyst during this step what are you supposed to be doing okay analyzing the infrastructure path used for delivery you have to be you know you have to understand targeted servers people and data available 
you need to infer intent you know of that of the attacker based on the targeting you should be correcting email and web logs you know we talked about how you're supposed to read these logs last time okay exploitation so after the weapon has been delivered the threat actor uses it to break the vulnerability and gain control of the target okay so during this attack of course uh the hackers are using software hardware or human vulnerability they are acquiring or developing the exploits okay use an adversary triggered exploit for server vulnerability you what are you going to be doing during this stage you know the training of workers in your organization okay making sure that web developers are trained to do secure coding you have to be doing regular vulnerability scanning and pen testing endpoint hardening measures here you make sure that you know all the systems are updated you make sure that unnecessary services are not running uh, on your system okay installation Okay, so the threat actors they have to install a back door so that you know they can continue having access to the compromised system. Okay, so during this stage, they do install the web shell on web server so that they can continue having access to the server. Okay, create point of persistence by adding services, auto run keys, and so on such that when you know you restart the system you know their presence will still be there okay some adversary modify the timestamp of, of malware to make it appear as, as, it, as if it is part and parcel of the operating system so during this time what are you supposed to be doing okay you should be using a host-based intrusion prevention system to alert or block common installation parts, determine if malware requires elevated privileges or user privileges, endpoint auditing to discover abnormal file creation, creations, determine if malware is, is a known threat or it's a new type. Okay, command and control. So the threat actors, they do have the servers on the internet which they use you know to control those infected systems okay so during this stage they, they you know they're able to open a two-way communication channel to see and see infrastructure okay some of the common c and c channels which they use include include http web dns and email protocols smtp uh, pop3 imap okay during this stage, what are you supposed to be doing? You know, researching on some of the possible new C and C infrastructure. You know, it is through analyzing the logs that you can be able to see these C and C channels. You know, you discover C and C infrastructure through malware analysis. So this is also a very very important, uh, uh, you know, course malware analysis. Okay. You should be isolating DNS, DNS traffic to suspect DNS servers, okay? Prevent impact by blocking or disabling C and C channels, you know? So I've been singing, whatever you have learned in this course, you know, has to be applied and you have to go deeper into these, uh, you know, materials action on objectives here we are dealing with what have the attackers accomplished have they corrected user credentials you know privilege escalation so with privilege escalation here what it means is that the attackers are going to attack your system and they're going to have 
the privileges of a standard user. But privilege escalation means that the attackers now, they have the privileges of an admin, okay? Internal reconnaissance, you know, lateral movements through environment, correcting and exfiltration of data, destroying systems, and so on, okay? On your part, what are you supposed to be doing? Establishing incident response uh, playbook, detecting data exfiltration, lateral movements, okay? Immediate analyst response for all alerts, okay? Forensic analysis of endpoints for, for rapid triage, network packet captures to recreate the activity, okay? So that is the cyber, you know, uh, kill chain. Apart from the cyber Q chain, we also have the diamond model, okay? So this is the diamond model here. It has four components, the adversary, capabilities that the adversary has. And then we have the infrastructure, which, which the capabilities talks about what are, what are the tools that the attacker has. The infrastructure, this is what the adversary is going to use to reach your organization. And of course, we have the victim here, uh, which is your organization, okay? So you can see the adversary uses the infrastructure to connect to your organization. And then the adversary also develops capabilities which are going to exploit your organization, okay? So that's how uh, uh, it is here. So uh, you can see here, one, the victim has discovered malware on one of the systems. Capabilities, you can see here, two, malware contains C and C domain. It means that this malware is communicating with the C and C servers. Okay. So C and C domain resolves to C and C IP addresses which are being used. Okay. And then four, firewall logs reveals further victim contacting C and C IP addresses. So you can see this is how you connect stuff. And then number five, IP address ownership details reveal the what? The adversary, the person behind the attack. Okay? So it is indeed very possible to combine the cyber Q chain and the what? And the diamond uh, model. Okay, anyway, we won't look at this, but just uh, the same thing, whereby what we're, talking about, what we're talking about here is you can see we have a reconnaissance here on top. So the adversary conducts a web search for a victim in a company called Gadget, Gadget Inc. Okay receiving as part of the results the domain name gadgets.com okay secondly again through the connaissance the adversary search network what administrator gadgets.com and he discovers forum postings from the users claiming to be the network admin of gadget.com and the profiles reveal their email what? Addresses. So this is how it is. So now they are going to send the payload through that email, you know. And if the admin clicks on that email, then the system will be what? Will be infected, okay? That is what is being explained here in short, okay? Incident response, section four. So you see, your organization has been hacked. How do you respond? 
very, very important that you have the incident response document, you know, but already these documents have been done by other organizations like NIST. So you can adopt this document as your own. Okay. So incident response aims to limit the impact of an attack, assess the damage caused, and implement recovery what? Procedures. So it involves the methods, policies, and procedures. You know, they, your institution has been hacked. Everyone is in a panic mode. You must have written down instructions that you should follow of how to handle the incident. Okay. So the following table summarizes the policy, plan, and procedure elements in an incident response. So we have the policy elements, statement of management commitment to incident response, okay? Purpose and objectives of the policy. What is the scope of the policy, okay? Plan elements, the mission, strategies and goals, okay? These plans must be approved by management. Okay. Procedure elements. Here we have got technical processes. You know, some of you know, uh, here we have the steps that we should follow when we are handling an incident. Okay. So who should be involved in handling a security incident? Management, of course people from information assurance, IT support, legal. So if you know the hacking is related to a criminal offense and so on, public affairs and media relation, relations. So these are going to explain to the public what happened. Because you as an analyst, you don't have the skills, you know, of how you can communicate with the public, but these they know. Human resource, that is, if you as an analyst, you were involved, human resource must be involved. Maybe, of course, you'll be fired, okay? Business continuity planners, all right. This is also very, very important. People from here have to be involved. You know, our data center, you know, has caught fire. What are we supposed to use? Do we have another data center somewhere? Okay, that is business continuity. How are we going to continue to function? Chutakoi. <laughs> oh, anyway, sorry for that. <laughs> and then we have physical security and facilities management. Physical security. So these, we you know, we need to get individuals from or you know, these you know, departments to be involved uh, you know, in a security incident. Okay. Uh, we have what is known as you know, the cybersecurity maturity model certification. Uh, so the CMMC certifies organization by level. Okay. So this is also another you know, uh, you know, uh, tool that we can use. Uh, for most domains, uh, we have five levels, you know, of how, you know, we should respond to incident. There's level one, where we need to, you know, establish an incident response plan, okay? And then level three, document and report incidents to, to, to you know, uh, stakeholders. Level four, use knowledge of an attack to refine incident response planning and, and execution. Okay, so you can also follow this, this model here. And then model five, utilize accepted and systematic computer forensic data gathering uh, uh, techniques. You can also use that. Okay, so NIST has got its, its own, which starts with preparation. Okay, so here the people they have to be trained, the tools they have to be acquired. Okay, and then Detection and analysis. This is where you know uh, 
you have to identify, analyze, and validate an incident. And then we have containment, eradication, and recovery. Okay. So, of course, here, uh, you know, uh, you need to implement procedures that have to contain the threat, okay, eradicate the impact, and then use backups to restore data and, and software. And then we have the post-incident activity. So this is where you discuss how you have handled the incident. You know, did you handle the incident very well? And where you need to uh, improve, okay? So I've explained on preparation. So this is where, you know, the team is set up, people are trained, tools and assets are acquired, and so on, okay? Detection and, an, and, and analysis. So we have got different types of incidents which will require different what? Responses. So we have attacks which use different attack vectors. Others come through an email, web, loss of data, and so on. So these, of course, they have to be handled differently. Okay. Detection, we have automated detection. Okay. Analysis, the use of network and system profiling to detect uh, an attack. Okay. Scoping, here we provide information on the containment of the incident and deeper analysis of the effects of the incident. Okay. All right. So, uh, containment, eradication, and recovery. So, after determining the validity of an incident through detection and, and analysis, it must be contained. So, this requires a containment strategy. Okay. The correction of, if, of, of an incident, I mean, of, of evidence, sorry. The identification of an attack. Okay, so sometimes if you didn't do detection and, and analysis properly, from here you can still go back to detection and analysis. Okay, and then move to post incident activity and then you can come back to preparation. Okay, so it is really a cycle. Okay. All right, so here we have got is the data correction and retention. So the collected data, of course, we are going to learn a lot. What are the lessons learned? Okay, this information is going to help us in future when coming up with, with, with the budget, when determining the effectiveness of our team. You know, what are some of the weaknesses that we are facing and so on, okay? So retention, of course, there's prosecution, okay? So the attacker has to be prosecuted, okay? And data has to be kept for a certain period of time, okay? The cost, if there's a lot of hardware and storage media that, that needs to be stored for a longer time, of course, this has to be costly. We need to think about this, okay? So, of course, we have uh, a number of institutions in Zambia, you know, which have to keep the data for a longer period of time. You know, we have RATSA with those cameras which they, they, they have installed. I mean, they do capture a large amount of information and they need to keep that information somewhere else for future use. Now, if that information is removed from the system, then, I mean, that is not good at all when it comes to tracking the cases and so on. So they really require infrastructure. Reporting requirements and information sharing, very, very important that, you know, whatever happened to the organization, that information uh, has to be has to be shared, okay? All right. Remember, we looked at, um, we looked at um, the, the VARIS database, okay? The VARIS database, 
uh, that is where you share, you know, uh, what happened to your organization, the type of an attack, you know, who attacked your organization, how you handled the situation, and so on. Okay. So, do we have questions on our last uh, module? Do you have questions on this? Okay. So, I think uh, today we're just going to end here. Tomorrow, we're going to deal with, the, with labs. Then on Wednesday as well, we are going to deal with the labs. So the thing is, have you, as you can see, in your group, uh, only one person has done the chapter exams and the final exam. Okay. So the thing is, you can also do it and there's still, you know, time. Okay. So tomorrow, make sure you have to attend because we're dealing with the labs very, very important labs. So it is from these labs that we're going to do where we're going to get the skills that are required to become a cybersecurity what? Analyst, okay? So uh, thank you very much for attending. I'll see you tomorrow.